In many places on Christian YouTube and on other news sites, we've seen the news that David Platt, the well-known pastor, is stepping down from his church. Now, this, of course, is not true, but let me explain who David Platt is so that you even know. David Platt uh, created controversy when he prayed for Donald Trump, and then he apologized after the fact. David Platt was the pastor who stirred up some controversy at his church during uh, during George Floyd and the BLM riots because he apologized for being white to his congregation. And he is also the pastor who's very well known for writing the book Radical, that Christians need to take a radical stance and that the stance of Christianity is actually a radical thing and not just something that situates finely in the culture. Now, David Platt uh, was rumored to be stepping down from his church because he just made an announcement that Mike Kelsey would be installed in a position over David Platt, actually, where Mike Kelsey will kind of be over all pastors of the church where, where David Platt is the lead pastor. So he's going to kind of be the pastor of the pastors and be their boss. Now, the reason this is important, the reason I bring it up at the beginning of this segment, is that Mike Kelsey is also the guy who, when given permission by David Platt to spout you know, racist, racist animus toward white people, he took the opportunity and did so in the most inflammatory terms. And I mean that literally because he said that if it was up to him that he would torch all white people. Maybe you remember that clip. If not, check it out. Totally honest, like, so being angry about the situation, but um, it's difficult for me uh, sometimes not to just torch like all white people because in particularly white evangelicals and Christians. I said this at the time and I say it again. If Mike Kelsey were white and he said, I want to torch all black people, is there any question in anyone's mind that he would have been fired immediately with prejudice, as ironic as that may be, uh, for that kind of statement? And the reason I bring all this up is that just a little bit of poison is enough to kill if you're not careful. And now Mike Kelsey has gone from, as very often people do on the left, has, has gone from totally sticking his foot in his mouth to promotion. And now he will be in charge, basically, of, of David Platt's church and be in charge of kind of navigating the things that are spoken about at that church. One can't help but believe the kind of racial animus and the kind of leftist nonsense that's present in Mike Kelsey will somehow find its way into David Platt's church. And one has to ask the question, does it even matter? Will we even pay attention to it? Will there be any loss of attendance at this church for continuing to do things that not only violate scripture, but violate common sense? And I have no such faith because we see that megachurch pastors continually benefit from a seemingly endless amount of people attending their church in defiance of obvious facts. And that's where I wanna bring up for Perhaps the last time, hopefully the last time. I don't like talking about it any more than anybody else likes to potentially hear it. But, but because this is so prescient in our minds and because this is so contemporary and important and because it happened just recently, I think it's important to just to finally close out conversation, the conversation that I've been having on my channel about Andy Stanley and the conference that he had called Unconditional for parents of LGBTQ kids in which he had two men who were married to men presenting at the conference. Now, he finally responded to some critics of this conference and he had some, I would say, some pretty interesting things to say that also do not square at all with scripture but sound a little bit more like the poison coming out of David Platt's church than, than actually the truths coming out of scripture. So I wanna show you just a couple of clips. And yes, I will not be able to provide the full context. If you wanna do that, you can go back and see the full thing. But I'm gonna faithfully, I believe, represent to you what took place at Andy Stanley's church after the conference on Sunday morning, which by the way, was at a service that was not streamed and was not televised, but Andy Stanley after the fact decided that he would put it up on YouTube, but of course, silence the comments. Uh, I wanna give you some of the flavor of what took place there as he's responding to critics of this LGBTQ conference that he put on, so check it out. Here's it. So back to the article. Um, Y'all are very smart people. So all you have to do is, you know, in 30 seconds, you can read between the lines. The author is actually accusing me of departing from his version of biblical Christianity. So I want to go on record and say, I have never subscribed to his version of biblical Christianity 
to begin with. So I'm not leaving anything. And he, if he were here, he would say, well, Andy, I've never subscribed to your version of biblical Christianity, and that's okay, we can agree to disagree. But this is so extraordinarily misleading. In my opinion, just my opinion, his version of biblical Christianity is the problem. His version, this version of biblical Christianity is why people are leaving Christianity unnecessarily. Now, maybe if you're a discerning Christian, maybe you've been watching the show for a long time, you can already see the problem with what Stanley just said. He doesn't subscribe to Al Mohler's version of Christianity. Uh, if you wanna be, I think, fair, uh, he would be saying something tantamount to, I don't subscribe to the Southern Baptist version of Christianity, so I don't subscribe to a, a biblical, faithful movement within the evangelical church version of Christianity. Well, I, I mean, honestly, very unsurprising, Stanley, because there are a few Christians who would actually pinpoint you as an Orthodox Christian theologian. In fact, you probably think orthodox is just another word for, I don't know, uh, white neocolonialism, something like that. This goes to show, again, the, the littlest bit of poison from the left comes into the church and you have to be careful of it. But ultimately what I wanna point out here is that your version of Christianity is just a stand-in for postmodern liberal theology. Th there is no version of Christianity that leans into what people have been criticizing Christianity for for ages. Well, you're just interpreting that based upon your, your background or based upon your denomination. You're interpreting scripture based upon your own personal preferences. But, but you know, the Bible is subject to interpretation anyway. So it's, it's everybody's version of Christianity fighting one with another. No, this is, this is why orthodoxy exists, so that we can understand that Christianity is something and not another thing. That it is something specifically. So, if Al Mohler has a version of Christianity and Andy Stanley has a version of Christianity, you're going to have to ask yourself, which one looks more like Christianity? <laughs> I mean, because that is a thing. Uh, and I hope you would say, if I'm going to subscribe to either one of their versions of Christianity, it's going to be Al Mohler's. Now, truthfully, the problem is, is that Andy Stanley brought this up in the first place because we're not supposed to subscribe to anybody's version of Christianity. We're just supposed to subscribe to the truth. And in a sermon, that is close to 50 minutes long, Andy Stanley doesn't bring up a single passage of scripture and actually deal with it in any substantive fashion. Probably comes as no surprise to some of you who have been following Stanley for a while that the man really doesn't have anything to offer from a biblical standpoint. So you decide which version of Christianity you wanna stand on. Um, I prefer to think that Al Mohler's is more faithful to authentic Christianity, which is the only Christianity that I'm concerned with. And Andy Stanley doubles down on this by saying things like this. Who attended the conference had already tried that, right? Christian parents of LGBTQ plus kids go there immediately. They pull out the verses, they argue, they, I mean, that's just, that's just where parents go. They pull out the convince, convict, coerce, control. Convince, convict, coerce, control. Convict, convict, you know, convince, convict, coerce, control. And just as a parenting strategy in general, how effective is that? Now, let me give you the context there so I'm not accused of being out of context. The context there is that when a mom or a dad finds that they have a gay child, they try to minister the gospel to them and minister the Bible to them. And what Andy Stanley says that those parents are doing at that point in time is they are trying to convince, they're trying to convict, and they're trying to coerce, and they are trying to control their children by delivering the word of God to them. That's what they're trying to do. Now, I mentioned this on the show before, but I do think it's important to, to mention something here. Our job is not to be concerned with the way people respond to Scripture. Our job is to share Scripture as faithfully as possibly, as charitably as possibly. That's our job. Andy Stanley, and I'll put this up on the screen, was more interested in trying to make his church a safe space for people coming out. Is that really anywhere in the Bible what we're supposed to do? Sure, we want people to be honest, yes, 100%. But the church is not supposed to be a quote unquote safe space for people coming out. The church is supposed to be a place where sin comes to die and new life in Christ is found. That's what we're supposed to be. So when parents actually read the Bible to their kids, what they're trying to do is give them the cure that they actually need to be set free. You know, Andy at the beginning of this actually even 
mention the fact that LGBTQ identity is on the rise. Why is that, Stanley? Well, that's because Christians have remained mostly quiet about this issue for all of the conversation about how judgmental Christians are and how Christians are pushing people away. Christians in modernity are largely quiet about this issue because they know there is a social cost to talking about it. And therefore, there is a social contagion out there that is kind of sucking kids, especially, into it. Gen Z is... Uh, has already come out as 20% LGBTQ identifying, which quadruples from two generations before it. Now, we could talk about why that is, but suffice to say, the, these aberrant sexual divergent identities are on the rise, and most of that comes because people like Andy Stanley are the norm in the vast majority of Christian circles. They don't want to talk about these things, and they want to be closed-mouthed about it. The worst thing in the world that could possibly happen to you is your kid come to you and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? Why didn't you tell me? You knew this was going to hurt me and you never said anything. So Andy Stanley can sit back and say, all you're doing when you read the Bible to people is you're trying to convince and convict, coerce and control them all he wants. But in the meantime, there are kids who are being hurt and damaged permanently as a result of this LGBTQ cult. And we need to do more than accept and love these people. We need to stand for the truth and we need to share the things that will actually help people the most. And here there's one last clip I want to show you. And this, I think, says it all. Hey, the conference wasn't for me. The conference wasn't for most of you. I guarantee you the conference wasn't for any of the critics because the moment or the day that they discover one of their children or one of their grandchildren claims to be gay or transgender or questioning, they are gonna scramble for people that can help them get inside the hearts and minds of their children. So we're gonna be scrambling for answers and we're gonna come running to Andy Stanley to get those answers or the guys that were speaking at his church. Now we have the answer for what's going on in society if you're paying attention. The reason your child might come to you and announce that they have some form of the LGBTQ intellectual parasite is because they've got sucked into a group of people who lie to them. They've got sucked into kind of a social agenda that ostracizes people who take firm biblical stances and welcomes people who want to sin against scripture and want to damage their own bodies. So we don't need to psychoanalyze here and we don't need Andy's help. What we do need is we need scripture. And in a sermon that again spans about 50 minutes long, we're never once told that there is hope for deliverance or freedom from the person who is struggling with same sex attraction. Never once. And the reason for that is because Andy Stanley doesn't actually want to come out and admit that it's wrong. Toward the end of his message, he'll say, uh, we affirm marriage between a man and a woman. But you know what? The guys who came and preached at my church and led this LGBTQ conference, these guys knew that before they came here. Well, congratulations, because it's not enough to just say we affirm traditional marriage. It's you got to go one step further and say that, that not only do we affirm traditional marriage, but we do not affirm homosexuality. And we want you to get the help that you need to get free from homosexuality. But this is what happens when you don't have an ecclesiological hierarchy. Now, I'm not praising Catholics per se here, but this is where I do see a benefit. Without a structure in place, another structure is gonna take its place. Evangelicals don't have that structure. They don't have a magistrate, they don't have a pope. Um, so what takes the place of those kind of structures is celebrity pastors, by and large, in the evangelical church. Listen, I don't want an evangelical pope, but we, we kind of have one, don't we? Whether you like it or not, the biggest churches and the pastors of those churches become the de facto Christian thought leaders for the culture. That's how people like Andy Stanley becomes the number eight most influential Christian leader in America in Outreach Magazine. The only thing that can stop that is to oppose people like Andy Stanley without the care of the world coming back and saying, you're being judgmental and you're being intolerant. We, we have to push that to the side and, and we have to refuse to allow that blackmail to work. And furthermore, we have to quit attending churches that refuse to preach the truth, whether you like their music or not. If we continue on the path we're on now, I don't blame people for refusing to go to church. What I do blame us all for is the kind of apathy that doesn't demand better for our leaders. I mean, read the Bible. 
God's leaders are missing it constantly and they have to repent publicly. To call Andy out on that kind of stuff is not being hateful. It's merciful and it's a cry for change to a man that doesn't realize that there are multiple trajectories to liberalism and if you don't stop yourself on the path, you'll find that you are hurting a generation that is yet to come because you refuse to stand up for what is right. And there are consequences for that, as there are with all bad ideas. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and go with God. So you just got done watching a small excerpt of a much larger episode. You can find the link to that full episode down below in the description of this video. So you definitely want to check that out because if you like that clip, you'll like the much larger episode. And while you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and click that little bell to be notified when great new episodes of Indie Thinker come your way. Thanks for watching.